Ida, Pingala, Sushumna. I'm wired for enlightenment. How to give a talk about karma, serious subject on the eve of holy. <laughs> we'll give it a try. The uh, Yoga Sutras of Patanjali contain a particular view of the process of karma. And it's a very practical one. It doesn't just sort of fly off into pure theory. And I think it provides some very helpful insights for managing the flow of action in your life. <clears throat> Our mind field is vast. The part of it we're familiar with is a tiny little piece. And the resources of the deeper layers of that field carry all the seeds of future actions that we have planted in all our lifetimes. A lot of times, with respect to the idea of karma, people will ask, why am I suffering now? Is it my karma? Well, the answer is always yes. Everything is your karma. And the purpose of the theory isn't so much to explain how we got into the suffering we're in today. It's really about how you create a future for yourself based on how you behave today. That's the real gold. As Swami Rama used to say, you are the architect of your life and you decide your destiny. I know a lot of times it doesn't feel that way. Sometimes it doesn't feel like we have any control over our lives at all. But when I start to struggle with some kind of suffering in my life, the first thing I do is to accept as an assumption that somewhere along the line, I did something that created an impression that put me here. And I don't do that in a sense of with a sense of self blame. But rather to take responsibility for my actions. It's
it's my duty, my inescapable duty, to live out the consequences of those seeds that I have sown before. And I think starting from that kind of acceptance is a really good way to begin thinking about karma. We have in the operation of karma several different terms. The most important are sanskara and vritti. So you yoga sutra students certainly understand those two terms. Sanskaras are the mental impressions that are created in the depths of our mind by every thought, every feeling, every action that we do. And thoughts are something you do, they're not who you are. Vritti is an operation in manas. Actually, I need to correct that. Vritti is an operation in chitta. Uh, the verb root vrit means to turn. So it's like a word for process. These are the mental processes that we experience as our thoughts and our emotions. And in the sense that we use it here, chitta just refers to the whole... Um, stuff of the mind field, like the soil in a field. In each lifetime, the sanskaras that are becoming ripe to bear their fruit in the next life come together in a subtle pattern. This mass of sanskaras is referred to by Patanjali as uh, the karmashaya. The reservoir of our karma. And when this body is done, at the last moment as you depart, that karmashaya will tell you three things. Jati, the species of your next birth. I use the length of that life and bhoga, the balance of pain and pleasure that you'll experience. And then in the interval between the last body and the next one, This subtle pattern guides you through that transition. Hopefully with the Guru's help. And 
and that's one place where a mantra is important. The subtle connection that you have with the guru at initiation. Provides the guru with a way to guide that process. And the mantra itself creates its own sanskara in your mind. And hopefully it becomes a very, a very substantial habit for you. Another important term from karma theory is vasana. When you have a whole lot of the same kind of sanskaras, then they form a vasana, a habit. Or as Swami Rama used to say, a groove in the mind. So that habit helps to helps the guru to also to guide you through the process of transition. According to the Tibetan Book of the Dead, Immediately when after you leave the body, you approach what they call the clear light. For someone who still carries a heavy load of sanskaras, the clear light will be too much. If you can go into that clear light, that's liberation. But if you carry a heavy load of sanskaras, they will send you down the path of reincarnation. And you spend some time in a sort of dream state experiencing the painful and pleasant results of the behavior in your last life. This is heaven and hell. So heaven is not the goal in yoga. <laughs> After a while, as as you begin to approach the time to get into a new body, you begin to have visions of couples making love. Because we experience so much physical arousal in that activity, we think of it as a physical thing. It is not. Sex is primarily a pranic phenomenon. The two life forces combine And the intersection of their subtle bodies creates an idea of what kind of life that being might have, what kind of body, what kind of life. Now, 
Now, most people don't realize that as they're making love, somebody else is watching. <laughs> the jivas who are waiting to be born are watching. Consider this when you make your choices of partners. <laughs> and if the intersection of those two subtle bodies matches the karmic pattern of one of those jivas, a conception will occur. And if the situation is right, human activity can't stop it. All, all this debate about contraception and abortion and all that stuff, it's all wasted air. If God wants a baby to happen, a baby's going to happen. The condom will break. The condom will break. The um, <laughs> The birth control won't work. <laughs> Something will happen. It's just incredibly arrogant of human beings to think that they can really get in God's way about this. So you come into the new body that you have growing in your mother's womb. And during that time, you remember all your previous births. And all kinds of other incredible stuff happens, of course. You learn 60% of your first language in the womb. That's why your first language is so different from every other language you learn. And all sorts of things about the relationships you have are shaped in those early months. One of the inventors of the field of clinical hypnosis was an obstetrician. One of the inventors of the field of clinical hypnosis was an obstetrician. was a, a doctor who works with pregnancy. Okay. And he told this story. A woman was having a baby once, and her husband was a presenter on radio. And whenever the baby heard the father's voice coming over the radio,
it would have a temper tantrum in her womb. Kicking her vital organs and punching at her. When he was home, it was fine. So they wondered, could this baby possibly know that the voice coming over the radio was his father? So one day when he was home, he talked in his radio voice. And sure enough, the baby went crazy. So it's a good reason to think carefully about what environment you're in when you're pregnant. I think uh, oftentimes when people in modern cultures look at people in traditional cultures and their practices around pregnancy, Often they're thinking oppression of women. Oppression. But a lot of those traditional customs are there to provide that kind of environment that's conducive to forming good relationships and, and developing a good mind as, as, a, as a person later on. And then when we're born, when we're born, the trauma of the birth process blocks our access to the memory of our previous lives. And I used to think that the boundary was the boundary uh, between us and the knowledge of our previous lives was absolute. But I was mistaken. Because sometimes very strong sanskaras from a past life can intrude into the current life. And then it's a good thing to do something about it. And there are lots of dramatic stories about this kind of psychological healing. So once we're born, the process of living with the karma that we have now the sanskaras that we have now brought into this new body begins to work with us. The sanskaras arise out of the depths of your mind. And they appear in your awareness as a certain emotional momentum. <coughs> a push to act in a certain way. <coughs> and most of the time, we just follow that push.
We act according to that momentum. And we create another sanskara, just like the old sanskara that then goes into our mind. And in this way, we constantly recycle our habits. And in the language of the South Asian cultures of spirituality, they call this the wheel of sansara. The wheel of death and rebirth. Or in a less tidy metaphor from Vyasa, a dog licking its own vomit. Vyasa calls this a dog licking its own vomit. So that's an unmindful life. A life without awareness. It's the life of a person who just sort of follows their, their basic instincts for food, sleep, sex, and self-preservation. And nothing much changes. Now the moment that that person begins to become aware, a little space opens up inside. A space that allows you to watch this process happening and to make choices about how to respond. Maybe it's skillful to follow the momentum that you're experiencing. In that case, go ahead. But a lot of times it's not skillful for us to follow the momentum. And then we have a choice to do something different. Something more skillful. So that we create a different sanskara. Hopefully one that is more peaceful, more loving. more compassionate towards both ourselves and others. Um, I have worked most of my life with a group of other therapists. And at one point we had some pretty significant organizational problems in our clinic. So we hired a, a consultant to work with us to figure out what the heck was going on. <clears throat> and we learned a lot about ourselves over a couple of years. Things went along just fine for a while. And then the same things started happening again. And 
and I got really mad. You know, didn't we learn anything before? And I examined myself very carefully about this anger. And I decided, I think pretty realistically, that I was right. But then some part of my mind asked me, if you act on these feelings that you have, even if you're right, is it going to contribute to a solution of the problem? The answer was the answer was clearly no. So I did something different. And it remains to be seen whether I created a better sanskara or not. I guess the future will tell. But there was another interesting benefit. By observing the arising of this anger in me from the perspective of buddhi, this purest, most subtle part of the mind field. which is causally beyond the formation of ego. So by observing from that level, I was able to break my self-identification with that anger. happened? Poof! Gone. Just dissolved. So there are two ways that your mindfulness affects how you put seeds of karma into your mind. in terms of the choices that you make to act? <coughs> and also in terms of observing from buddhi so that you break the self-identification with those emotions, those emotional momentums as they arise. And this is really a description of human free will. This is how much free will we have. You know, we're still heavily run by our habits. And it's not all a bad thing. The fact that your nervous system has a lot of habits in it means you can respond to things quickly. <coughs> and if you're about to step on a cobra, that fast reaction is really a good thing. but the percentage of habits that we can change. Mm. 
will make a real difference even in this lifetime. You watch someone like Swami Veda, for example, as a young man full of anger. A lot of it had to do with what an, an abnormal childhood he had. He was a child preacher here in India in the same way that Mozart was a musician in Europe. His whole life was around, built around being a scholar and a teacher. Never once in his life did he play with other children. Never once in his life did he attend any class. And he used to say that the fact that he never had to deal with politics on the playground is why he was not very good at politics with adults. So as a young man, he was very angry. And because he was also committed to being a good spiritual person, it was buried really deep. <laughs> so deep, it would give him nosebleeds. really serious ones. And one night he had a big nosebleed in a place where he was staying. And his host, who was a woman with whom he had a motherly connection, came into the room the next morning and saw the blood on his pillow and said, so angry. And he was so shocked. But he realized she was right. So from that day, he started keeping a diary about his daily wrestling match with his anger. And he kept this for many years. When we knew him, It's like he could, couldn't get angry if he tried. <laughs> he could, but it was really rare. And of course, he was so motherly with everybody. Sometimes he would criticize you, and three days later, all of a sudden, you'd realize, oh, he was criticizing me. Because <laughs> he did it so sweetly. And you, you could not make him angry.
nothing could make him angry. And people tried really hard. And sometimes some of the rest of us got angry for him. <laughs> and he would say to us, look, nobody can make you angry. All they can do is hold up a uh, mirror to the anger that's already in you. And that goes all the way back to that experience he had as a boy. <coughs> and look at how much transformation happened in one lifetime. He said to me, Stoma, if I can do it, you can do it. So I say to you, if I can do it, you can do it. You can transform your life. And what it takes is being mindful towards your, the flow of your thoughts and your emotions and the decisions that you make to act on them. I think I'll pause there. We have a little bit of time left, and I'm sure there might be a question or two.